Okay. Even okay. I don't, oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome for Kios uh, Value Working Meeting on April 22nd. So please write your name and tell us how you are feeling or anything, anything you have on the desktop or anything you want to share, just write in in the meeting minutes. Can we, uh, I, yeah. I'm looking at the working, am I clicking the wrong link? My value working group notes say our next meeting is April 1st, 2021. I have pasted on the, the link on the chat. Yeah, I know. If it's that like, is the old one. It was with Andy, so we moved to the new document. No, so. no, no. It's like, yeah, and now it's, of course, today. Um, okay, now, now I'll figure it out. But today, for some reason, it's not opening the link. Oh. I don't know. I'll, I'll figure Works it out. for me. Yeah, it okay. could just very well be my browser. Okay. So uh, the first topic on the agenda is uh, academic focus group as uh, uh, Stephen told that he's attending on the CSV conference. So that was very last thing we discussed in the last meeting. So the goal is like, uh, what are we hoping to gather from a CSV conference or thoughts or suggestions or ideas? So, um, by the way, I did have a mango this morning just because food is always the most important thing to talk about. But moving along, um, I, I pitched a birds of a feather session, which is primarily a discussion in terms of, you know, what, what do academics want in terms of the ability to be able to get credit for open work within the, the academic system of traditionally peer reviewed stuff, which doesn't really work anymore for a lot of people, right? Or, or is certainly not the um, I am collecting a bunch of links and resources to, you know, articles and guidelines and stuff that I'm going to throw out there and try to collect through discussion some of the pain points and some of the goals and desires. Um, I recently had a conversation with our associate provost for faculty progress or something like that. Um, who's also leaving. <laughs> We're going to get another one soon. But um, we are looking at, at our university, these, and I assume lots of other universities using these kind of master database metric import collect systems for trying to manage the horror that is academic annual review and plan of work and promotion and scholarship record and all of that stuff. These are proprietary of course systems that are supposed to suck various things into, um, into them and automatically kind of ignore duplicates, remove duplicates or stuff like that. The Institute had looked at four, had narrowed it down to these two, and was gonna start pursuing, you know, deeper investigations of them when, you know, COVID hit and everything came to a screeching halt. Um, so the, the, and, the, and, per and, the purpose ahead. here is, is uh, including software contributions as uh, evaluation criteria for academics not not just software but you know the world of open science right mm -hmm. you know grabbing stuff and so you know we've done some you know very preliminary playing you know mike mike nolan my students have found a way to import Center for Open Science, Open Software Foundation platform data into chaos, into our, um, sorry, into Grimoire, into our local instance is, is just a thing of, of goofing around to see what could go there. And these two links 
theoretically in this brief conversation I had with this associate provost, you know, some of the reasons they were interested in these two is that you can, their APIs will theoretically allow you to specify other databases to pull stuff in for your institution. So I think in the long term, my, um, my team will look at whatever we do with our mashup and what we can get out of that into these systems just to see what works is early stage beta testing. And what I'm hoping to get from this birds of a feather is where other people are, are running into pain points or other things that are a wish list for things they wish that their academic overlords considered that they don't. So my output for my university at some point this summer, I'm going to come up with a very sketchy first draft of recommendations and best practices within our institution for being able to cite the work that we all do, you know, in parallel with or as enhancement to or somehow semi equivalent to the peer reviewed article that is the, the master of all its surveys. Um, so I'm hoping that BOF will inform those, the writing of those practices and be input for this group in terms of broadening our thinking or at least understanding more about what the academic need is. Um, was that all coherent? Yes. Yeah, certainly, certainly more coherent than the website for watermark plus digital measures. Yeah, one of them is a pretty good okay. Yeah, I think that's the one that's horrible. I think the, Yeah, it's like I don't even know what they do after reading their whole website. Uh, digital science is fairly straightforward. Yeah. Um, and, but it doesn't include open source contributions. No, but I, my hope is that, you know, we'll start playing with these. I assume once we start talking, these guys will get some kind of trial accounts on their systems in which we can do some playing around. So, and then the other, the other piece of this is, you know, there's an overall research and scholarship committee for my university that looks over stuff like this. And luckily my college's rep was stepping down. So I stepped up. So I'll be sitting on that committee as all this stuff is happening. And is, um, and is this, part of the OSPO work or is this adjacent to the OSPO? The part of my charter is to try to figure this out. Okay. Right, my, my charter evolved from a, a 10 page wish list that evolved out of five or six meetings with different sets of faculty. And, and one of the constant complaints was why I'm here, right? You know, my, my college, my college believes that unless there's a peer reviewed journal article, you've done nothing, right? So how do we fix that is essentially the, you know, I, I can't fix it at a policy level, but I can fix it at providing recommendations and um, from the OSPO and then hopefully interfacing with these systems moving forward. Okay. So it's, it's part of my second job that I don't get paid for. Yeah, is, is what it is. Yep, I understand that. Um, so and, I, uh, this makes sense to me. And Stephen, would it, it's kind of like a chicken and egg question here. So listening to you talk, there would potentially be value in producing a metric that at the moment I'm calling RPT, <laughs> right? And so um, we have in the chaos um, spreadsheet, we have kind of these different focus areas. One is called individual value. And so from an individual value perspective, we talk a lot about, at least in value so far, like job opportunities. So th there's a value in engaging in open source because it might provide you additional job opportunities. So that's a metric, right? And so there's a value in participating in open source because it might actually support an RPT case. I mean, that's that would be the, the hope here is that this 
work translates into a positive impact on somebody's RPT case, research so, promotion and tenure. So maybe, maybe there's a kind of even a high level metric at this point, which is just called like RPT. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> a great place to start. Right, I mean, and then as you move forward, this metric would probably like break down maybe into more granular ways of thinking about it, but it could, and this is the chicken and egg part, it could give you some support if we could per publish a chaos metric that you could point to <laughs> that you that you helped develop and you help use to create your argument. So it's kind of, we're kind of- Well, even, you know, I'm, I'm a full professor, so you know my, my art yeah. R, RPT yeah, is, yeah. personally for RPT is is non-existent. But um, even if there was like a really sketchy draft that I could go to the scholarship group at some point, the folks say, "Hey, you know, look, here's one way of thinking about this." Right? I mean, the the interesting thing for the non-academics in the room, right, is that every as, as universities have gone less and less traditional in terms of the science or humanities, right? Um, within some disciplines, it's fairly easy to get your rankings, right? It's like, oh, well, you know, I'm a scientist and in the last five years, I've had three articles published in the journal Nature, right? Which is like one of the few journals that anybody outside of academia hears about because sometimes the New York Times or NPR will say, oh, well, today in the journal Nature, this revelatory science thing happened, right? So, but in some of these disciplines, there is a, here are the top three journals, here are the top five conferences and you need to hit these targets in those things to be a worthy human being, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's video game instructors, right? Where we can kind of go ahead and, and um, you know, write an article on the psychology of people playing this game or stuff like that, right? But there's very little academic journal stuff and there are no top academic conferences. In fact, most of, most of the conferences, as with open source software, right, they're industry conferences. And a lot of academic places say, industry, doesn't matter, right? And this whole idea of ranking a conference is, there's really only two education conferences in, in, in computer science. Right, where a, a professor of computer science would publish, here's how I teach. There's one by the ACM and one by the IEEE. That's it, there are two, two conferences. And, I, and I've had a dean tell a, a professor of mine, a colleague of mine, that he would not fund her presenting at the IEEE, what is it? Do you remember Matt, IEEE? whatever, the IEEE Education Conference. Um, yeah, we won't fund you to go there to present because its acceptance percentages are too low. They'll take 25 or 50% of what's accepted instead of only 10 or whatever his personal metric was. But it's one of the only two places you can publish as an academic, right? So it doesn't matter what its acceptance level is at a certain point. If those two journals, you know, if those two conferences, the only two that are out there, that's where you that's where you do your work. Oh, that's not you. So you have to go to the top computer science journal and hope that they'll take something on education, which they normally don't, right? This is the weird world in which many academics are. <sighs> I'm sorry, Matt, you are only moving your lips. Oh yeah, a lot of a lot right. of the academic contexts are like this. So like if you're an emergency management researcher, again, there's kind of only a few spaces, even even as an open source researcher sometimes. You're kind of limited um, in where you can publish. I I, a, yeah, I have a question on this is like, 
are we focused on the like relating this tenure and uh, promotion thing with the open source thing is are we focused on the impact or are we just focused on the producing other stuff like for example they develop uh, any faculty de developed a software which has a huge impact it's not published but it is an impact which can be considered as a big thing but on the contrast, there is another faculty which has produced a software, but it does not have a wide impact or adoption. Will, should that be counted as an effort or like in the tenure thing, or is it the impact that matters most? So Matt, why don't you go first and I'll add in my thought. Yeah, I mean, I think we could sort that out in this metric here. So I think both could be critical. So, I mean, developing a piece of open source software that is used widely downstream, by other people, certainly that's a big thing. Um, making a kind of say this today, but making like a critical contribution to the kernel as an academic <laughs> could be um, also quite influential. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Right. So the the written large pieces of getting evaluated in academia are impact and translation, right? So I wrote this one thing and a bunch of people forked it. Can also be, you know, because the idea of peer review is if I publish my equation or my formula and other people replicate it, and then they start sharing it through academic journals as part of their research process, right? Which is basically, you know, I forked it or I maintained it or I added a new feature right there, those kinds of things in software, but it's also the open science piece, the, the open data piece, open hardware piece, like who is using my stuff, right? The academic stuff, the academic stuff is, at the end of the day is I'm not just talking to myself. And either I'm talking to people, to a lot of people who are using what I'm using or my field is very narrow, but impactful. And, and even though my work is only used by this people, right? In my field, that's who there is, right? It, it's that kind of impact and translation. It's all about that stuff. And the, and the way generally academia measures impact and translation is through peer reviewed journals and we're trying to find ways in which impact and translation can be measured in other ways that a given professor's department chair and dean would understand right so we wrote and I mean, if people want it i can i can share it but because game development is, is this weird niche in a college of computing because we don't have top three conferences, top five journals. We wrote a 10 page writer to our promotion process saying, you know, here's where we publish, here's where we distribute, here's how you register or understand impact and translation in the context of the work we do, right? Professor Jacobs got the institution a license to publish games with Nintendo, and he got the first university game on the Nintendo ecosystem, all right? Academically, yawn. Game industry-wise, fairly reasonable street cred, right? You know, did 300 million people play the game? No. You know, a couple hundred thousand got it, which in terms of money means nothing, but in terms a game about game history, working with the strong National Museum of Play on a commercial console. It's not like proving Einstein's gravity waves, but it's a thing in my corner of the world, right? That's the kind of stuff that we're trying to do with these metrics to say in our corner of the world and, you know, the guys in chemistry, most of them don't know what the Linux kernel is, right? Or, or why it would be important or why the entire internet might benefit from your work, right? You've got to be able to, to go ahead and communicate that and make it clear. Could we, yeah. I put in the chat, the RPT metric, like just kind of a wireframe at the moment. Just listening to talk, Stephen, and being an academic myself, right? Trying to 
to simply capture some of these things. Yeah, and so to loop back on what do we want to get out of this CSV conference in a couple of weeks? You know, even showing this as a discussion point, right? Here's one way in which to think about this stuff, right? Um, if you were writing be, something like this, what would you add? Yeah, yeah, that'd be super helpful. Like, what is, let's describe what this metric is. What would be the objectives of this metric, you know, to, uh, and people may have different ideas. I mean, I just jotted one down just to support RPT process. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I think about all the different ways that there can be impact in RPT and, if, you know, contributing to the kernel is visible and has public awareness. Uh, number of downloads. I mean, it's like, it's easier to gain number of you know, forks, clones, contributors. Contributors are a hard metric to gain. Um, use is, is, it's a hard metric to build confidently. Like there's no, there's no infrastructure and it like surrounds academic publishing for knowing how many people are using the thing that you build. Right, you know, there's, there's Google Scholar, which looks at a bunch of papers to see if your paper is mentioned in a bunch of other papers, right? That's, and it gives you what is the, the R value, the H value, man. I don't even know what it is because I don't use it, but. Yeah, the, yes, the H, H index, the H, <laughs> index. H, yes, the H10 index, yes. You know, at the same time, there's a, there's a bunch of academic papers that say, you know, um, and something that should be clear to everybody is just looking at the H index tells you nothing, right? Everything's gotta be in context. Everything has to be human evaluated. And so if you're just looking at the H index in the top three conferences and top five journals, you're not really kind of digging deep into what the work is. Agreed. A lot of editorial reports are boost people's H index. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and if you're an editor for a journal. Yeah, and this was the problem with the, or this has been the discussion around the alt metric stuff, right? People who are arguing, well, I'm in the humanities and the fact that I have 100,000 Twitter followers should mean something in my field and other people saying, you can get 100,000 Twitter followers by offering a McDonald's hamburger certificate to anyone who signs up. So how does that really impact, right? So- Is that true? No, yeah. I just mean it. I was the general, <laughs> I mean, the idea that it was easy to gain, it was too easy to gain. I get it. Oh, you can, yeah, you can buy Twitter followers. No you can, you can buy them. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. It's just straight up. Question. So, Stephen, taking, are you, are you, I don't know if you're in that document. That I, I, I see it in front of me, yes. Okay. So, I mean, I, it would be cool if, if when you're doing the birds of a feather, if you could use this, because I mean, the whole point is that we could just try to capture things within these categories. And then from that boff, like a metric could potentially come out of that. Like we have to do some, you know, like shining up and all that kind of stuff, but that'd be awesome. Yeah, no, that'd be great. Cool. Yep, so. And is this, Stephen, is this conversation also occurring in the OSPO++ community? Um. Yes and no. It's been alluded to a couple of times, but almost all of those folks are just um, really trying to figure out how to talk their university through letting them make an OSPO. And what okay. would be OSPO? So this is like, on the checklist of something an OSPO might do, yep. but nobody's really thinking about it yet because it's only me and, and Saeed and Hopkins yeah. who have a functioning OSPO at this point. So, so there's a couple like upstream conversations that need to be resolved first before like, yeah. these kind of things can even start making a difference. Yeah, so it's a, it was an orders of operation. Um, people, there's- Yeah. And, does, and that, does the, does the OSPO interact only with scientific software or is there a relationship between your OSPO and the IT organization? So 
right now, um, what the what what my OSPO is doing at the most at, at the current time is one, we've we've drafted the equivalent of what our open source policy might be um, that covers software, hardware, all the other things, right? So that we drafted one that's starting to make its rounds across its year long process of approval. Um, we got part of the Sloan Foundation money we got was about building a, a student and staff team to to help make faculty projects more openable or the ones that are already open better in terms of generating community and stuff. And a lot of my focus has been on selecting those first 21 projects and getting my team to start to work with them. Um, this metric and, and the larger picture around this metric is kind of like one of my summer projects. And this will never be policy because policy only happens at the university level and the university's policy for RPT is just each college should have one that makes sense within their context. So I can't mandate at the university, right? So this, and if I don't get the open source policy accepted as policy, this stuff is gonna exist as our recommendations and best best practices for helping people do this, right? So I hope to have that published to my website by midsummer or fall. That here's what the discussions in the world are in terms of journal articles, look at these, here's what we're doing. Here's this technical experiment we're doing with OSF in Grimoire. And there's a rumor that the university will have a bigger system in which we can pump this stuff in. That's like how that stuff is evolving. It's it's all just coming together. But the idea is that between Lamar and OSF, we can get everybody to either put their stuff in there, or if we get one of these giant master software systems where the the, pub, the formal academic publications and metrics are being sucked in, can we pull that back out or do we just input our stuff to the larger overall system? Knowing that there's going to be a much larger overall system both, both helps and hampers what I'm doing right now there. It helps me to know that I'll be able to get more people to participate in this kind of OSPO style registration of projects, what that system is in place. But since I don't know what we've adopted and what it will import and what the interactions between the systems will be, I'm also kind of in holding pattern. Is, is that a coherent answer? No, no. Okay. So, uh... In the interest of time, should we move to the other agenda or do we have anything to add to this or any I mean, this plans? This is good. I mean, we have a wireframe metric that we think we can, that Stephen can take to his boff and all is good. Yeah, and while we're talking, they just sent out the day and time in an email. I'll drop that in the chat. So if folks right want to hop on, if they're available. They should right do so. Cool. It's, it's a it's a free conference, so. Okay. So uh, the next agenda in the topic is uh, participation in OSPOCON. So I have uh, written a proposed document. So like the topic is what is the story like? What should we tell them or? Uh, is the theme for that. So if we take a look at this, so this is a, just a sketch and the goal uh, I was trying to is like, what that comes to my mind is uh, I, trying to understand their perspective that what, they, what are the pain points for the OSPO or how do they want to assess the impact of that uh, OSPO or their open source participation? Ooh, I have a good idea. So... Yes. Right now, there's a 
Twitter survey that's floating around in the Twitterverse. <laughs> yeah, right. I've retweeted that it is, myself. That yeah. is um, that Elizabeth put together. I mean, maybe we could kind of show some of that data there and just yeah. use it as a point of reference. I mean, yeah. I don't know what you think about that, Elizabeth, but. Yeah, that's fine. I think we have, I just looked this morning, we had uh, like 45 responses. Um, there's one more day, so I was going to retweet it again. Yeah. Um, the, the results are inconclusive, however, so. But that's okay. That's idea. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> are they like equally distributed across everything? Basically, yeah. yeah. That's okay. Well, that's interesting. That these are the, the entire process is painful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or... Interpreting the data is the least one. The others are the higher ones. Like collecting it and yeah, like... knowing what data to get and using data to make change. Okay. Yeah. okay. It's, it's, that's interesting to me. I, th I would love to see that in front of folks. Okay. Yeah. So, like, uh, so, hmm, that's a good idea. So then, what is our story that we in the survey we found these uh, things that uh, people are struggling, especially in collecting or uh, uh, defining the data, uh, and uh, how to go about it. Or I'm trying to make a story yeah, that so can be presented. Yeah. So I think the story is, you know, we we in the Chaos Project have been working on this pipeline. I kind of hate that word, but we're working on this pipeline for a while, you know, in terms of the process by which people can make data-driven decisions. I also don't like that phrase, but make data-driven decisions um, to improve their engagement with open source. Um, and just through our own reflection, I think this was really Elizabeth's kind of motivation here, through our own reflection, it's not clear to us where the pain points are in this process. Okay. So right, Elizabeth, I think that's, that was like, where, where are people yeah. start getting like, tripped up? Yeah. How can we be a best help to the community? Yeah. If everybody kind of answered thing. collecting data, then clearly that's yeah. so. When you say in this process, you mean the OSPO perspective of managing their work or which no. are you the broader no. chaos measurement process? Yeah. So just kind of, so the, we're out of OSPO at this point. So this okay. is, um, um, no, I think, no, you're, I'm sorry, you're right. It's still in OSPO, but like Elizabeth put together the, the Twitter survey, which I don't think was necessarily aimed at OSPOs, but it, it right. was just kind of like, where does everybody live? But this might be useful for an OSPO and to just know that this process is problematic on three of the four. Yeah. I dropped that uh, screenshot of the results so far in the minutes, if y'all want to see it. Okay. I'm surprised it's a low number for interpreting the data. I think those are people who haven't gathered it, <laughs> honestly. Because once you have the data, I mean, there's, there's exponentially more things you have to do to interpret it. So, so I think even, I think you're probably right, Sean, but I'm with Elizabeth, like what this tells me is there's People have like even when fourteen percent are saying, so then maybe the the birds of a feather, or I'm sorry, the lightning talk could say. So what we realize that in the chaos project is we have our work cut out for us along each one of these horizontals at the moment, each one of these bars, and um, here's we could in ten minutes. It's getting pretty tight, but maybe like offer what we would think would be. No, not 10 minutes to end the meeting, 10 minutes for the lightning talk. So, oh, okay. So like we could maybe say here are some proposed first steps to help overcome these barriers that the chaos project could could work on. I It could be just as simple as that. And yeah, you know, it's like uh, like baby steps, like uh, like what about Bob? <laughs> so. Death therapy. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, should we bring it uh, like full proposal i was thinking because uh, there was no clear story in my mind so that's where i thought make it a lightning talk uh, just bring one point and 
bring it in front of the community and discuss with them. Yeah, I don't think this, there's a full talk in here because yes. a full talk is kind of, that, that kind of requires that you be on stage for right. 30 to 40 minutes unless you yeah. speak really or, slowly. Or Zoom. <laughs> or Zoom. Yeah. yeah. So I think it just if you're just presenting the results and maybe talking about what this tells us in the community, in the CAS okay. project, and then maybe just a few first steps forward. Okay. And, and we can talk about what we think those first steps forward might be. I don't, it's not okay. just to push it to you, like you figure out what, <laughs> you figure out what we do next. Um, but it's, I guess the, it'd be cool to just end the lightning talk is like, we care about this process. Okay. We're listening and we're gonna start taking action to help overcome these particular areas. That's, that we're on it kind of thing. And we're looking forward to your participation. That conclusion can be. Yeah, if you have any suggestions about what you think first steps might be, if you, yeah. you know, if you think there's something in the pipeline that we missed that we should be asking, that's also cool. Yeah, I think I think um, I think a lot of it comes down to um, changes to the software that we have um, and more user centered design. I don't think um, Grimoire Lab or Augur follows uh, a, a path that is what people are trying to accomplish. So like initially getting some data is great, um, but oftentimes there's a desire to continuously get data, um, easily create new repos, segment them, um, I, I think, I think the process of getting the data and then knowing what you have and what questions you can ask is, is, a is a barrier. So there are great tools. There are a couple of great tools inside chaos for getting data, but I think the process of helping people know what to do with that afterwards, um, and to sustain, to sustain that work because neither tool continuous, I mean, Augur does continuously collect, but either tool, like for example, if you own an org um, and there's new repos, I mean, things can get messed. Um, so I mean, I guess I'm just saying there's a, there's still a lot of programming and, and analysis work that falls to the organization. Uh, and to the extent that you know, we're starting to understand the stories and the metrics that need can be made easy and are highly valuable. But I think there's more work to do there and, and connecting what the chaos metrics are to every view of, of what you're showing people. So there's a clear relationship between what's in the tool and what the metrics that are represented in that particular display. I think that those, that's also important. I mean, I think there's a Adoption is, a, is, a user, is becoming a user-centered design problem, I think, is my opinion. So maybe I'd suggest on that first one, knowing what data to get. Mm -hmm. Like a couple of things that we are doing in the CAS project, I would actually say that the DNI badging program is helping people know what data to get. It is. Mm -hmm. we, we framed it. We've said these are the things at this point that matter. Um, we've worked around what those things are. So I, I think you could mention that. I even think our our short stories that we're putting together are okay. helping yeah. help people know what to get. And then to Sean's point, like... The, and that data is more human understandable data than the data that underlies a lot of our metrics. Yeah, I mean, those efforts are really just trying to help orient people to, to know what data should right. matter. Like it's you know? written, these are questions that people understand. They're not yeah, like exactly. fields in a JSON file. <laughs> right, right. like here's a giant <laughs> JSON file, this will help you. Yeah. So, <laughs> Steven's raising his hand, I think. So I, I had a thought. One, I mean, 
one of the services that Open at RIT provides to faculty through this fellows program is we do a bunch of UX UI work in terms of like personas, helping people figure out who their users are and what their use cases are. Is that something Chaos Community has done or would want to do at some point? We've we've done we've identified key personas um, early on in the design. What what I don't think we've gone back and done regularly is revisit them and the different tools have different constraints on what they can do. Um, I mean, the personas are uh, OSPOs, community managers, foundations, corporations. Um, those are the primary personas that are software targets right now. Uh, I don't think we have a persona for academic alt metrics, um, but it's probably one to add. I think. I think if it's, if they go as far as initial design work for those personas, I think having other people reimagine what the UX might look like would be extremely valuable. Okay, let's let's talk to Mike about that too. I'll add okay. that in the email I'm sending between you and him, Sean. Okay. Um, we'd have to balance it in terms of when we can do that versus when we can do we can serve the faculty where we're lining up as fellows, but especially if it's revisiting what you folks have already done, it, it might not be a huge uh, lift. Yeah. And, and what, we're, what we're doing a lot of is trying to balance, you know, very long-term efforts with faculty who need much shorter Mm -hmm. Like some quick hits from us, so that might fit in. Right, I'll yeah, yeah. I'll add that in. So does this help, Vinay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll wait for one day, then I'll contact Elizabeth for the final result, and then maybe I'll write a, an abstract for this and I'll share with the community for the feedback. What does it do? Uh, the due date is on, I guess, June or something. Oh, okay. So this yeah. is tons of time. Okay. Yes. Yes. Cool. Okay. Great. Matt, I think uh, All Things Open was the one that's coming up really soon. It's April actually. 30th, I think. Yeah. yeah. And that happens two weeks after the dates for the OSPOCOM, roughly. Yeah. So for this, the date is June 6th is the closing date for the uh, CFP for OSPOCOM. That's right. Forever, forever, future, far away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have four minutes left. Uh, the next agenda was uh, to finalize this organizational influence metric we have developed. Uh, it's almost Under done. Maybe to if I think Yash may have like just a comment on the standardization of the README structure or the README. Sure, sure. Then we can go over that. We shouldn't okay. take too long. Yeah. We, have no, no, three, we have three minutes left, so yeah. I can wrap it up. Thanks. Man. So I, apparently, if you all have noticed that we have a different structure for the README files and different working group repositories. And we are trying to create a standard structure that can be implemented across all the repositories. And so if you could take a look at the document which I've shared, and I'm basically looking for any suggestions and feedbacks. introduction. So yes, is this the same format uh, format for all the working groups? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I can tell you, we talked about this. Was it in DEI, Yash, yesterday? I forget yes, what it was. Yes, yesterday. Okay. DEI. So we kind of made a few suggestions here, just in terms of things around the contributing file, like anything that 
basically anything that appears to be um, consistent across all working group readmes that we move that consistent text to the handbook. Okay. And in the readme, we just point to the handbook. So okay. if there's a consistent way of talking about, like, for example, again, the, the, the con a contributing document, like how to, how to make a contribution in a working group, Right. Then we move that to the to that handbook, handbook and we can just say go because that way we don't have to maintain a contributing .md file. Okay. Uniquely in every uh, repository. Okay. So the question is, Jesh, what support do you need? Do you want uh, us to fill this document and then post it or uh, how is the plan? That's what I'm trying uh, no. to understand. I just wanted uh, each working group to take a look at it. And if it satisfies the requirements of each working group, then it's perfectly OK. OK. I think we left DEI yesterday pretty happy with yeah. how things were. I'm not, I'm not sure the contributing practices are uniform across the working groups. To be candid. Mm -hmm. across, so this is for the metrics working groups? Yeah. Or all? The metrics working groups in particular. In particular. So why are they not the same? I, I, I think the way that people contribute in risk often involves uh, enumerating resources in Google spreadsheets and then linking them in meeting notes later. And that ultimately evolves um, into a metric, possibly. I think in evolution, uh, there are, it's pretty standard, it's very similar. Um, so I, think, I guess risk is kind of the outlier right now. Um, it's, it's not exactly the same as the others. And I haven't been to, I, I haven't been to. Okay, well we can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's just so something to think about. Yeah. I also think there might be a checklist in GitHub's engineering where if you don't have a contributing file, there, there's like a certain set of things you have to have for your repo to be some a repo that comes up when you do a search, like toward the top of the list. Like there's like the basic, and I don't know if the contributing.md is one of those documents or not. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. Uh, but that is a document we can just create and we can throw a copy, link in there. Still. Copy paste, yeah. Uh, that's true. I, I, would, that's and I, I would still say that a link would be better just because. Yeah. Uh, the more places we have it duplicated, the the harder it is to uh, get yeah. everything aligned. Well, and if we have a link, then if there are um, idiosyncratic behaviors within a working group, they can put those after the link. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, we could merge the common process and keep them in the community handbook. And whatever process is different, that could be included below in the yeah. uh, contributing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you. We're at the end, I think. But not yes. Okay. Yes. We are. Thank you, everyone, for the participating. Uh, I think we can continue this discussion. And thank you, thank everybody. You so thank Thanks, you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.